We're rolling. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're here for Chicago, the windy city for games. Um, and to get started here, I'd like to give all of our wonderful panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. So let's start with Craig down at the end. Hi, I'm Craig. Uh, I'm a, uh, an indie developer here in Chicago. My studio is called Sinister Design. Uh, my last video game was uh, Telepath Tactics. You might have heard of it released last year. Uh, right now I'm working on my first ever commercial board game, which is kind of exciting. That's actually on Kickstarter right now, True Messiah. It's super cool, you should check it out. Uh, but you probably want to know about what I have to do with the community. And that's slightly different. Uh, I am the president of Indie City Games. I run the meetups and whatnot every month or two. Um, and let's see how it is. Uh, I also run the website IndieRPGs.com. If any of you make RPGs, you should like email me about it. <laughs> is anyone having trouble hearing me? No. Uh, no, but I think okay. she's trying cool. to get you. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and go next. My name is Sarah Sexton. I'm a technical evangelist with Microsoft, so what I can add to this discussion is a little bit of the corporate side of gaming, but I also uh, immerse myself pretty deeply into the indie community here in Chicago because I've got a really big passion for everyone here in uh, indie gaming. Uh, I love I love independently made video games because they tend to be a little bit more like puzzle, adventure, and a little bit less shoot and stab. So that's just a personal preference with me. And uh, you can find me at Salia, S-A-E-L-I-A, -E on Twitter. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but I work at Microsoft and we have a presence down here in Chicago. And uh, I can help you create games and I can also like help you download free software through our BizSpark program. And not a lot of people know about that, so it's my job to help people find success with, with technology in the like in the Midwestern community. Hello, everyone. My name is Ross Gersman. I'm the founder of Loading Law, which is a law firm exclusively for video game clients. I work with independent game developers and help them with their legal needs, anywhere from starting their businesses to handling their contracts and litigation. I also organize a video game law summit called Chicago Video Game Law Summit that helps give free advice to game developers. And when I'm not losing sleep over those two things, I'm either working with the BGA Gallery, uh, which works with independent game artists, and also the IGDA here in Chicago. Hi, I'm Keisha Howard. I have a um, advocacy organization. It started off for women, but now we've opened it up to people who feel that they need to have voices in the gaming, geek culture, and tech communities. Um, so I started Trigger Gamers in 2009. And uh, since then, you know, just being immersed in the community and understanding the different mutations and differences that, are, that have happened over the years, because the landscape in 2009 is different from now. Um, and I also have a digital marketing agency called Blaze Breakers, where basically I convert what people are passionate about so they can focus on that, and I take that and uh, make it accessible online. <laughs> I couldn't just like go into it, I just I don't know. Um, my name is Kevin Fair, I am the CEO and founder of iPlay Games. Um, really quick, really easy, I am your turnkey solution for any video game event. So realistically, I've found a way to provide staffing, logistics, consultant, and equipment rental for any video game, and that's usually larger size events, a lot like Valicon. Um, and then um, I guess I, I, I'll go into my experience as, as to kind of what got me there. Um, I really enjoyed uh, having and throwing tournaments. Um, I got into the competitive fighting game scene in about 2008, 2009, and um, kind of looking at and noticing where they lacked in quality in tournaments kind of made me look at video game events overall and where people kind of overlook some things that, you know, you would think, you know, kind of come naturally. But over time and practice, I've taken what I did in competitive in the competitive tournament scene 
and turned it into a social scene of just kind of like enjoying video games. And then the idea of having competitions can be the content for it. Awesome. Hi, I'm Heather Decker. I'll be your moderator this evening along with these fantastic individuals. I'm the chair of IGDA Chicago. Um, I'm also a lead producer here at Zynga in Chicago. Um, and I do a lot of other different things too. Um, this last year, I was um, working with the IGDA um, Women in Games Ambassador Program, um, which gives uh, some talented ladies scholarships to go to GDC. Um, occasionally, I work with um, other folks in town, um, like Craig's Group, or Sugar Gamers, or uh, Voxels, or, you know, we all love to collaborate. So that's about it. And I guess now that you know who we all are, we'll get going with this. So, first off, what exactly makes Chicago's game development industry so awesome? Any thoughts on that? We have a lot of the uh, studios here in town kind of listed out here. There, there's just a few, actually. We have quite a few more than that going on. And also, we have quite a few different industry events um, in this lovely, windy city. Does anyone feel strongly about Chicago and would like to share your yes. on the panel? <laughs> yes! Yes! Uh, Chicago's awesome. Just in general, as a city, and therefore the fact that we have games here in Chicago means that they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's point number one. Uh, Kyle Bailey is not on this panel, but he puts together an industry night, which is really great because you get the chance to actually like mingle and meet a ton of developers at all these studios. Um, I really enjoy that. Uh, there's another fellow, uh, George Huffnagel, who occasionally gets people together um, in sort of a similar capacity. And uh, that's kind of cool because you get to sort of mingle the indie and the triple A or maybe just double A, I don't know. But, <laughs> uh, but I've got a story about Industry Night I'd love to share. Uh, speaking of Kyle Bailey and his Industry Night, like meeting people who work at all of these different studios and uh, realizing that I, I needed to add some more to the list. I don't have like, Jelly Vision or Jackbox games on there. So my apologies to the letter J. Uh, <laughs> uh, but as for industry night, um, I've only lived in Chicago for about two years now. This is my very first job working at Microsoft right out of college. And right when I graduated, they swooped me up and flew me out here. I didn't know a soul. I didn't have any family or any friends. I didn't have any roots here. So uh, I was. I had to go through my coworkers to try to find out if there was any kind of video game community. And so my coworker knew someone uh, who worked in the academic realm over at DePaul, who introduced me to Doris Roosh, who's a professor. She's in charge of the uh, Play for Change uh, game lab over there. So I met her. She introduced me to one of her top students, who was JJ Backen, and he told me to go check Facebook for Industry Night. And so like through this chain of events, I found Industry Night. Their, their next meeting was going to be like on October 28th, the last Tuesday of the month, uh, back in the year, like. I think it was 2014 when I was looking for this. So I just RSVP'd on Facebook. I showed up to the rail bar and grill not knowing anyone. And I felt like a little mouse just crawling into this crowded room. They didn't have a sign. They, they didn't have like, go this way. So I just sort of looked for the bearded people. <laughs> there was a room full of rambunctious bearded people in the dark. <laughs> I said, this, this might be the right place to go, and there was one girl who looked a little bit like me. Uh, she kind of had strawberry blonde hair cut a little shorter than mine, and she, uh, she saw me, and she was so bubbly, she jumped right up and said, hey, are you here for the video game industry night? And I said, yes, am I in the right place? Yes, you are. I'm Elise. Nice to meet you. And that became one of my good friends, Elise Motsny, and she was so warm and welcoming. She introduced me to pretty much everybody who was at Industry Night, including Kyle, who then introduced me to like Andy and Craig and everybody, and probably Heather and Sherry. So all these key players in the Chicago industry community who happened to work at places like Crossword and Robomoto and Iron Galaxy and Netherrealm, I was able to just like dive into this pool of people and suddenly I made all these connections and then from there I was golden. I could find pretty much anything from this hub of places. So 
just moving in and not knowing anybody, this was a really great start to attend this industry night, which are always on the last Tuesdays of every month. And I just have so much love in my heart for Kyle Bailey for putting these on and giving people a place to go who don't know what's going on in Chicago. Absolutely, absolutely. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on in Chicago besides just in the industry. So I wanted to keep on moving and talk about all the cool stuff in Chicago. Um, so a lot of the people on this panel have obviously talked about their involvement in the community. So we know that you all do cool stuff, right? So there's a bunch of other cool stuff going on up here that you know maybe you don't do. So my question to you all is what is cool and going on in Chicago that you aren't necessarily involved in but want to give a shout out to? And then it was quiet. <laughs> <laughs> So something I'm not directly involved in that is one of my favorite things is called BitBash. It's an independent games festival that happens right here in Chicago a couple times a year. The biggest one is usually at the end of summer, but they also have a few other ones. And basically it's just a big party with tons of games that you can come and play. It's all staffed by local people in the game industry. It's organized by local Chicago people in the industry. And it's just a really cool place to play a game, meet the person that made it, ask them questions about it, and just meet other people who either are doing that already and want to help, or meet other people just like you who have no idea how to do it, but want to learn with you. And it's just such an awesome community atmosphere that just kind of crosses all these different groups, all these different communities in Chicago, whether you're AAA or independent, or if you're on the business marketing side of things, or the art creation side of things, like just everyone shows up for this. So this BitBash is something very unique that I haven't seen in any other city in Chicago. I definitely second that. That and was another one of my first events I ever went to before I knew anyone. It's also on Craig's chest right now. And it's on yes, it is. Yeah, it's on both. <laughs> uh, it's on me. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's two representations of this right now. In case you know, don't know what BitBash looks like, right there. That's, that's the logo. Yeah. Go find it on the internet. You know, come to an event. It's cool. Awesome. Um, um, I would, I would like to give a shout out to Indie City Co-op, which despite the fact that it sounds like Indie City Games, I'm not actually involved in. Uh, Ryan Wiemeyer, the fellow who made Oregon Trail, uh, opened up a co-op working space in Ravenswood like a couple of years ago, and if you happen to be indie and want a place where you can work surrounded by other indie developers inexpensively on a monthly basis, that's like a super cool place to go. Um, I know Cards Against Humanity has like a similar deal. They like offer co-op working space as well. Um, that's more like Blue Line located. Uh, those are both really good resources if you're looking for working space. Yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning that. And I'd like to give a shout out to Kevin Tresky, who definitely has so much hustle in this in this town. Kevin Tresky is like a homegrown Chicago boy, as far as I can tell, and uh, he he like searched all over every bar in Wrigley where he lives for a bar with a big TV, really nice specials and cheap foods and power outlets and kind of like a back section where he could encourage people to come uh, and hook up a laptop to the TV and play games without being disturbed or kicked out. So he had uh, the Chicago Gaming Union running for quite a while and he also started a nonprofit called Play on Chicago for the express purpose of promoting Chicago-built games and developers. And I, I really admire Kevin Tresky's hustle. So there's a lot of good Kevins in this town. I was town. say Kevin's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, 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 and maybe you might be able to help me remember. I think it's uh, Ladies and ladies and Brunch. Um, I really wish I could get their name down specifically, but I think the idea is so nice because Okay, so I like playing video games. I like having competitions, but... Maybe Geek Girl Brunch? Geek Girl Brunch. Something along those lines, man. I know they're going to see this and be like, how are you going to give us a shout-out and not remember the name? <laughs> but conceptually, conceptually what I love about it is that it is about people that have similar interests, but they're eating brunch, and realistically they're separated from video games or anything like that. So the idea of coming together is people-oriented and not necessarily game-oriented. Plus... I like breakfast food, <laughs> so I have not here, been here. involved with that. But I think that that I thought it was a great idea when I heard of it. I think, like, I always get caught up um, out of town whenever they have it. But realistically, it's like come talk about some flavor of the month or something that they think about over brunch. And I, I don't see how you can beat that. Realistically, <laughs> I like I like breakfast food a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I think that 
Brunch is pretty awesome. Yeah. And yeah. on the topic of women in Chicago, I can't let the community slide go by without uh, talking about Sugar Gamers and the Fox Cells. Um, and I'd love for Keisha, you, you can pick one, I guess, but it's probably easier to pitch yours and for me to pitch mine. But <laughs> I'd love to talk about the community. I mean, well, uh, Sugar Gamers is, is, is started from, I just wanted some people to play games with. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't like one day I woke up and jumped out of bed and I was like, I wanna be an entrepreneur and have a whole lot of administrative tasks to do. That's not what I said. <laughs> I said that like it would be, because I was working in real estate, like it would be so cool to have cool girls to play games with. And at first I thought that like, you really had to be immersed in the gaming industry. Like you had to be competitive, like Call of Duty times 100. You had to, you know, like know the button configuration. You had to like develop games, make games, know people, know everything. And for me, you know, I just liked playing games. Like I wasn't good at them, <laughs> I just liked playing. Um, so I put out an app, I'm like, you know, there's no, because I thought at the time, just like, well, well, you know, it has to be a community out here for what I'm looking for. Just people to play games with that are just casual, you know, regular people. Um, and in 2009, when I looked, there wasn't. And it shocked me. <laughs> so uh, what ended up happening was just through what I wanted, you know, to just play video games with others and have. Uh, a community with people that had common interests. Sugar Gamers was born and I met so many women who may not have had like something specific like I'm super good at this, I'm an expert at this, I'm working in this industry or something like that, but they all came together over these common interests and because there was a community now, uh, we're more encouraged and inspired to go after something in that industry. So that's how uh, Sugar Gamers was formed, and since then, we've done a lot of different, uh, you know, projects around the city, and the landscape has, you know, changed. And I would like to consider us one of the organizations that kind of keep up with the changes because we don't want to, you know, sort of get stagnant talking about the same problems. We be solution oriented to what's current currently happening. So um, that's what Sugar Gamers does, and so we don't have like uh, consistent events, but we will have. An event soon called Insane in the Game at um, a corporation called Scientific Games. So even though they they specialize in um, casino uh, games, casinos are, are trying to get more, you know, the community to understand that they have relevant games. So then they want to reach out to the community through Sugar Gamers and uh, offer people jobs. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that and be involved in that and do anything that's going to help you know, sort of be a liaison between people who just have common interest and in actual opportunity. And uh, the way that Sugar Gamers is for women who play games, I guess Box Sales is for women who make games. Uh, similar story, we really wanted to just have a community of women that can get together and develop games, whether it be sound design or art or programming or any of that, or producing. Uh, we wanted to create a community that, that could like foster, create sort of getting more gender diversity into the game industry because we feel like there's a need for that. Um, but uh, it's, it's a really similar thing, so I'll just I'll just let us go because we kind of already discussed it. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. It is. going to have a game jam soon. That's true. Yes, yeah. October 15 and 16 in the Indie City Co-op. We're having spooky game jam. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited for that. Our game jams are usually 36 hours. This one's only 24 hours, so it really only just, just rapid <laughs> prototype. Don't even try to make the next Resident Evil. Please just oh, make, so. make Pac-Man ghosts or something. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch in something that's not necessarily a group, but um, something that actually kind of contains a lot of events and also points to different groups and the different companies and the different schools is uh, ChicagoMakesGames.com, which is actually run by um, Jamie Sanchez, who is involved in a lot of the other groups in town. But if you ever want to know what's happening in Chicago with games, that's a superior hub for just being able to hop off into all the different groups and events that are going on at any given time. So 
the for, uh, chicagomakesgames.com. And all of the icons and blurbs were taken straight from ah. chicagomakesgames.com. Good info there. <laughs> There's good info there. So yeah, we have a pretty fantastic community, basically, is, is what we can summarize here. Um, so moving on then, uh, there's also a really great just competitive community, which at this point I want to hand it to you because this is your area of expertise, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, I think one of the more interesting things about competitive gaming is everyone sees what they see on eSports, they see you know what they see on television about the emergence of eSports. And I think when we start talking about Chicago, what's like super unique to Chicago is that we grew up fast. Like our adolescence was like really quick. I remember in 2008, 2009, bars used to laugh at you if you were asked them to have a gaming event there. They were, I, they just couldn't even understand it. Most bar owners and managers really didn't fathom the idea. So the reason why I bring up bars is because most people that watch the Cubs don't get to go to Wrigley. They watch that at the bar. You know what I mean? That's a part of like regular walk-in entertainment. The idea that you could walk in and go, oh, I get that that's baseball. I see the feats. I get why this is supposed to be exciting. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the Cubs, but like <laughs> you can walk in and see why it's exciting. And so I used to say, why don't we have that level of translation for video games? Why can't you go into a place just regularly and say, I see why this is exciting. I see why competition is a good thing. Guess what? How many people go to a bar and they still play trivia night? You know, something that is, I mean, easy and great in its own right. But realistically, like, we didn't grow up playing trivia night when we were kids. We grew up playing Mario Kart 64 around the house, and we understood why it was fun. And the competitive aspect, regardless if it was worth something, you know, at the end of it, you knew why it was fun. So what I like to talk about a lot of times about the competitive aspect is, Look at how much the uh, barcades here in, in Chicago are blossoming. Like, and they're taking all of the entertainment that you would look at. If you go to headquarters, you look up and you see things from the late 80s and the late 90s on, on their television screen. Sometimes they play the wizard, stuff like that. Um, I, what I do pretty frequently at Emporium is we still host our Street Fighter Five monthlies. And it's not like there's two televisions there and people see somebody playing and they kind of walk, walk along. We have like 10 setups plus their 20 foot projector screen and people look at it and watch it like they watch the Bulls. They sit there and kind of go, oh wow, I know that. I know about Street Fighter, but I don't play at that level. And so what I feel like one of the things that we're really doing a good job of here in Chicago is that we're trying to capture the spectacle of competitive sports. So I mean like the FGC is really cool. It's where I got my start. I did a lot of Super Smash Brothers tournaments when I was in college and undergrad. Um, I was a lover of Street Fighter for years. It's something me and my cousin bonded on when we were kids. And so when Street Fighter 4 came along, that was like natural fit for me. And um, that's really where I kind of kicked off my career and things. And um, I really enjoy how Chicago is like enjoying the spectacle of it. I don't know if anybody here is from RMU or not. I think I saw a couple of guys in the game room that are. But RMU now has their sports team giving out scholarships, their esports team rather giving out scholarships, and they're doing spectacle live watch, you know, competitive sports or whatnot. That's, I mean, like, that's what I would have to say I love about Chicago is we grew up kind of slow, but our adolescence was really quick. I feel like this is something we're catching on to. And you do a lot of Twitch streaming too, so the Twitch scene is starting to get a lot bigger in this particular area. I mean, the Twitch scene is really popping. I mean, like, when you look at it, we have so many, like, young creatives that are thinking about, like, what is it that I'm doing that's entertaining that I can sit and meet other people that like it or want to watch me. And there's a ton of uh, Twitch meetups. I want to say that's one we probably could have brought up, which was Chicago Twitch. Chicago Twitch meets among some of the partner Twitch, you know, streamers, and they, you know, talk about and, you know, almost have, like, an industry night themselves. And I mean, like, oh, again, I feel like, we took something we used to look at and say, you know, it was obtuse. And now, a good portion of us that are turned to 28, 29, 30 are saying, like, this could be a career for me that, you know, everybody can watch and enjoy. Absolutely. Um, so another another great aspect that we have really strong backing on here in Chicago is, is the legal side. So I'd like to turn it over to Ross at this time to talk about... Oh, just because I'm a lawyer, right? You're right. Yeah. You, are, you are a resident <laughs> expert, Ross. I try. Uh, so I mentioned earlier the Chicago Video Game Law Summit, which is a group and uh, annual event that I organize. And what the panel's 
look like is I fly in lawyers from around the country, and we've actually had some from out of the country, who deal specifically with this industry. They may be in-house counsel for a big game publisher, or they might be, uh, like me, a founder of a video game law firm that deals with many different clients. But I bring them together and they talk about different topics. So for example, you know, Kevin's talking about esports and competitive gaming. They might be talking about professional esports and how that crosses over with gambling regulations sometimes, or how that crosses over with sweepstakes regulation. Uh, we also have panels about copyrights and trademarks and intellectual property, talking about what kind of content you can put into your YouTube streams or your live streams, what is you know, what is copyright infringement, where that line starts to blur. Uh, and personally, I came to this because I was just so interested in coming up in the debate on video game violence and whether you know, there was a lot of issues in the news about whether or not that was making children violent and whether or not video games on the internet should be regulated for content and kind of constitutional issues that came up with regulating free speech that way. So I just got so interested in video game law as a practice and then especially after I met independent game developers, there was no other kind of law that I wanted to practice because these were new developing interesting issues that the legal system is never going to deal with before. Something like selling apps, uh, having uh, items for sale inside mobile apps that are potentially sold to children, having to deal with privacy settings on data mining apps when kids might be using it, getting a hold of their personal information like their name or their spending habits in games. Uh, these are things that no one had ever thought of before, and that makes this area of law very interesting. I think that um, the Chicago as a city has a very mature community because we have people like Ross and other lawyers that I, I can think of, probably five, that live in the city that are helping people not make mistakes. And there are marketing professionals who can help you with something that you might not already know how to do. And like you can learn from other people and instead of just sort of like having your head buried in the sand saying, oh, I'm just gonna code and I'm just gonna cross my fingers and hope everything works. You can find people who can help you publicize and market your game uh, make sure that your like your friend DA NDA contracts with your artists don't blow up in your face, and distribute your games onto consoles and mobile developments, and you can get free software to help you spread your game onto other platforms and get the word out into the academic community. So th there's kind of a one-stop shop for everything game-related in Chicago, and then you bring in like Twitch streamers like Kevin and Keisha and the Sugar Gamers to play your game. So it's, it's really kind of all made in-house right here. And I, I really admire that about this city. I would say one more thing about this city. Like the reason I love Chicago is because there's so much room to make something innovative here. Like, uh, like going to other cities like San Francisco and New York and Seattle and Boston, it's like they already have some solid communities for gamers there, which are great, but Chicago still has like this space to really create something new. And that's really exciting to me. And uh, I really look forward to the day, which I think should be coming soon, that large companies will start having their bigger events here instead of going to the East Coast and West Coast. Like uh, just recently Riot just uh, moved all their servers here to Chicago, so I think that's a good sign. But being a part of this community now, I think has very positive, you know, um, I guess ramifications for your future career here. Like starting it here is like so much, there's space, there's opportunity here. Whereas uh, in other cities, I think it'd be a lot more competitive. Here you're gonna make friends. Like the story that Sarah has is very similar to a story that I have when I started Sugar Gamers. We might not have that, you know, huge, you know, Capcom might not come here every year having huge events, but the community is so tight-knit, you can find somebody that shares your interests, that shares your, you know, um, that will warmly help you go into the industry that you want to go in. And I just love that aspect of the Midwest, whereas I don't get that feeling as much East Coast, West Coast, because it's very established. All the communities have been there, and that's that's cool. But we still have choices and space and options and versatility here that I really enjoy. Yeah, um, 
quick show of hands, how many of you actually know what Indie City Games is? I don't know if we actually got into it. Okay, so like three of you, cool. Uh, I had a similar experience to both of you when I was just getting into the, uh, the indie game developer scene here. And it was actually Indie City Games that sort of got me into it. Indie City Games is a uh, monthly or bi-monthly, we're kind of still figuring that out, uh, meetup of indie game developers from all around Chicago and the Chicago land area. And it's just, it was just, I started going in like 2010, I knew nobody, and within like three months, they were like, do you wanna be on the board? Do you wanna like, and I, I've just met so many cool people, um, like, I don't know, it's, it's just nice. It's like you kind of feel like you belong because you know everyone, you get to meet everyone, and you get to see all the cool stuff they're working on way before like anyone else does. Like, you know, when Chris Wade launched his Kickstarter for Sausage Sports Club, I was like, oh yeah, I've known about this game for months. I saw early builds because he brought it to Indie City Games. It's, it's just, it's really fun. I, I really enjoy like being part of it feels like I have friends, <laughs> as opposed to just like people who happen to also be in my industry, which is nice. With like minimal effort, uh, the the networking uh, capacity here to like get in the you know gaming e culture industry is really awesome. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You just have to take the time, get out there, and meet the people, and just you know just be open with what it is that you want, and it happens really quickly. I mean, the last two weeks have been wild. Like last month, I think it was last Tuesday, Polygon was here and they had a general meetup for everyone in the industry here in Chicago at one of the local barcades. Uh, the next night, we had industry night on Wednesday. Thursday, I think you had a meetup just like with your friends at your place with a ton of different folks. And I think Friday, <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was a good night. Um, <laughs> well, there was something Thursday. I don't know. I've, I'm so fried from running this Kickstarter. It's entirely possible I had something I don't even I think it, for that, you know. <laughs> Friday, like Video Game Art Gallery had an art gallery opening for uh, Game Art versus Art Game over at Columbia. And then this week is BowerCon. So there's an after party at headquarters later tonight. And then there's all the networking that everyone's been doing since Thursday for this and we we'll continue doing tomorrow. So there's just always something going on. Like you never have to set your schedule ever ever again, because every day someone you know on Facebook will call you and be like, okay, there's like three events this week, let's collaborate on buses and Ubers. And <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're right, yeah, no, I totally did it. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, absolutely, yes. so much going on here in Chicago, it's very exciting, um, including just getting an education for games. So there's tons of game schools in Chicago too, which is tremendous, and I know you've been involved with um, having a new city games at DePaul and then other other activities at DePaul. So yeah, how's 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 DePaul going? I would um, love to know how you reserve that. Like how does that work yeah. for people? Uh, so we don't actually always have them at DePaul. So we have occasionally had them at like say Columbia. Yeah. Um, we had one at the Indy City Co op once, which was extremely tightly packed, but fun. Nice. Um, yeah, we uh, we're not like I don't know, we I, I should say this. Indie City Games was founded by Aaron Robinson, who I think now goes by Aaron Robinson's week, uh, and Scott Roberts, who is an animation faculty at DePaul. He's a professor of like, yeah, drawing stuff. Uh, so the group has had a long history with DePaul, sort of as a result of uh, Scott Roberts being co-founder and sort of wanting him to promote DePaul, but it's not technically a DePaul program. Right. Well, um, no. Anyone is welcome to come. But um, the academic programs in Chicago are super awesome about supporting all the cool things going on in Chicago. Uh, like Indy City Games, um, IGDA Chicago has had tons of events just at the different schools. Uh, they're all really excited to see Chicago succeed too, which is which is excellent. Does anyone else have anything cool to say about academics in Chicago? Oh, uh, well, yeah, the, the guys who made Octodad, the young horses, yes. they all went to DePaul University. Octodad blew up to be a huge success, as well as Oregon Trail, made by Ryan Wiemeyer, who was a student and a professor at DePaul as well. Yes. So they kind of have a good running history. 
and I can just, I, I thought of five different things, like Indie City Games, uh, they've got the DePaul like, video game club called Defrag. Uh, they do their senior capstone events there where you can go and check out the seniors' new games that they're building, and maybe you'll find an early build of a, some, some success that blows up a couple of years off, down the line, and the Play for Change Lab which I think is a great way to like uh, addressing mental health issues and diversity issues and like impoverished community issues getting into building games. And so there's a lot there and Columbia College has their own industry night. So um, like there are a lot of really great community events that just so happen to be hosted in universities. So I'd just like to give those a shout out. Oh yes, uh, so add another bullet point under Industry Night, call it Manifest, it's their senior capstone project. I, I just think it's so fantastic that like everybody gets all dressed up in suits and ties and dresses like, and they invite in industry professionals to come sort of scope everything out and maybe pick out a winner and exchange a few business cards and make magic happen a few years down the line. Also free beer, that too. <laughs> Very important. Snip your butt, like, I think you're a dog, 
and you play three-dimensional snake, so you're kind of like a, like a dog corgi that just gets longer and longer, <laughs> and you are trying to snip your own butt, but it's basically a snake, but in 3D, so you, you, don't just go, you don't just go up, down, left, and right, you can go forward and back and curve around your own body, and you turn into this like really long, slinky dog, constantly attempting to sniff your own butt. As you do. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but it's, it's a really cool like spatial awareness game because it makes you think about all of three dimensions as you're weaving and winding and not not running into your own body. <laughs> it's a cool concept. I, I don't think that he uh, finished it, but I think he should. Absolutely. So <laughs> that is a good time to roll on into questions. We have just a few minutes. Our lovely audience would like to present something. I think you can for Ross since you know about Ron. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this. I'm going to leave the company a little bit nameless, but you, you may have heard about it how they were receiving bad reviews on Steam, so they started to sue them and Did you know to, know to, yeah. Yeah. to, to release uh, their client's personal info so they could sue them because on the lawsuit it said, uh, uh, like, Joe 1, Joe 2, uh, Jane, uh, Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2. Like, is that an actual valid lawsuit? Um, I don't think so. I think a lot of lawsuits aren't valid, but I have a very <laughs> different definition of it. I think it's a frivolous lawsuit, but basically what they were getting to, for some of you who may not be familiar with the case, is like a game company was mad they were getting bad reviews, and they're trying to make the claim that bad reviews of their game is defamatory to them, and because they're going to lose money on lost sales, they have a reason to sue the bad reviewers for defamation if it's not a grounded, good criticism of the game. Uh, where the interesting wrinkle comes to is they wanted to find out who the bad reviewers were, uh, many of whom were anonymous online. So they asked uh, the platform Steam, which is run by Valve, who had all of their information to turn over that information so that they could then sue the people and that's raised a lot of questions lately over just individual private information and when can you be private online and when should you be private online? And if, some, if you are giving bad reviews, is that defamatory or is that just doing a public service? And the answer to those questions is I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody does right now. Um, there, there's been a lot of that going on online because I, I think that a lot of game publishers and also studios have kind of done the metrics to figure out a bad review can lead to this many lost sales, which means this much less money. So they kind of, it's one of those, just because they could doesn't mean that they should. A lot of companies are trying to kind of have the flow of, of bad reviews. So legally speaking, I don't know what's going to come of it. My hunch is that it's all going to go away very soon. Because anytime you start attacking people's privacy, they seem to have something to say about it. Yeah, Steve already said no and kicked him off. Yeah, Steve, that's, right. ah. that's just the latest in a long saga from that studio. They've done crazy things for. Like, I feel like I, I feel like it was marketing. I felt like they were like, let's do something so crazy that people will at least would like read about it at something at some point. And guess what? I did. <laughs> like, I saw, like I saw it, and I kind of felt like I was like. Who, who in their right mind thinks, like, I'm not a lawyer, so don't, you know, but I was like, who in their right mind thinks that they're going to successfully go after someone's private information, you know, and then, you know, people be like, oh, man, that's a great studio, and so I started to ignore it immediately. So are you coming from the standpoint of, like, any publicity is still publicity? It's still publicity. Uh, it's like one of those types of things where it's like, well, we got bad reviews already. How much worse can it get? So, like, at least let's put our name, yeah. So I remember the big PR problem that, like, Overwatch was having with the Tracer images, and everyone was hating on Overwatch for using those but you know shots what? of Tracer. But I that led to so like, many yeah. sales at the end of the day. Like, they weren't hurt at all. But so. honestly, I feel like it's because Blizzard handled it really, really well. I think they looked at something that people said, like, the character is not about her, her, uh, her glutes. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the key to the character. And they were like... That's not a bad idea. I don't have the characters. Gloops have nothing to do with our abilities. And they took some, some pretty fair criticism, and I think they handled it well. And I think that's what knocked it out. I think you're right. I think that's yeah. really important. It's almost how you handle the problem more than how you fix the problem. Absolutely. All right, we have time for one more question. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, you have outlasted. Um, so you mentioned how Chicago was so great because there was a lot of room to grow. 
tomorrow. What do you think is the best way for um, people just getting into the community or even just people in it to help make it something even bigger? I think just by things like this, just coming out and being present and like kind of helping pull as you climb, just like if you see, if you're part of the community, go to other community events and kind of cross-pollinate and help your friends promote their events and help find other people for them. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are meeting new people all the time and you might not be able to help them with what they're working on or you might not know how, but I bet that you have a friend who does. So just like putting your friends in touch with other people you know to help them. Uh, putting them in touch with groups like all the ones that we mentioned tonight to help them come together because even though we, I think, one of the things that's unique about Chicago, we have so many different organizations, we listed like a million of them, they don't always collaborate all the time. So you have so many options and so many people to see that sometimes you miss out because those groups don't converge. So help those groups converge by getting involved in them and that will help everyone kind of climb up. Also, if you have a lot of money, uh, just write out a check to Craig Stern. Uh, that would really help out the community. <laughs> so the the long or sorry the short answer is get out there and get involved basically. So all right, without further ado, I want to thank our wonderful panelists. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. I'm super damn, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>